Today we're going to be talking about burnout and overtraining. Sometimes we feel very tired, burnout even, during school, sports, and everything that we have to do during a typical day. But first, before we get into the lecture, let's look at how Dan Gold defines burnout and answers questions about burnout. Hi Dan, thanks again for talking to us. Um, I'd like to ask you about burnout now. Um, again, a term that's bandied about in the media and, and by coaches and athletes. What, what uh, could people watching this, what, what should they understand by, or what do sports psychologists understand by the term burnout? Yeah, I think you hit an important point. People have a lot of different meanings. Uh, sometimes when somebody leaves a sport or discontinues a sport and stops playing, oh, they burned out. Sometimes that's the case, and sometimes it's not. I stopped playing the sport because it wasn't fun or other t types of things. Sure. Burnout occurs when what was once an enjoyable activity no longer becomes enjoyable right. because you've been under long-term constant stress. Right. So two features, really. A change and, and long-term stress. Yeah. It, it, one key thing is you have to, it's got to be something enjoyable from the front end, something you liked, but then because of stress over time, it shifts from I liked it to now the stress has kind of weighed me down and my liking and my motivation is dropping, even though I used to like it. Yes. So my question, how does it happen? I think it, we've probably touched on that already in, in terms of defining it. So can I ask you... Um, can I ask you, how, how can we recognize it? Is it very obvious to people, or, or um, can it be hidden it, sometimes? It can be hidden, and, and actually I'll go back, because in terms of uh, what causes burnout, it can be caused, we did a study and found in tennis players who burned out, it could be caused by one, uh, internal factors like perfectionism. They, they had to be perfect all the time, right. and that generated this constant stress to be perfect. Um, and it, it was perfectionism with a concern for mistakes tied in. Right. We also found they had some players had like a crazy or pushy parent that just how to you know always on their case and criticizing them from what they did. And some it was physically driven. They didn't get enough sleep. They didn't eat right, and they pushed themselves. Right. So stress can come from a lot of different sources. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and, uh, and and can we recognize? Is it easy yeah. to recognize? Uh, no, I, it, burnout, it, in terms of recognizing burnout, it's, it can be difficult. Sometimes we, a coach can see it because you get a performance drop despite the training. Mm -hmm. Or you get people, they don't show up excited for training anymore. Sometimes it's more psychological. Right. They're losing their motivation or you get a performance drop. But sometimes the person doesn't know they're burning out. Right. Um, so one thing we found is coaches especially with like younger kids in the junior sport, mm -hmm. burnout has a really negative connotation. People don't sure. want to say like, I burned yeah, out. Sure. So coaches will ask kids when that had actually burned out and is everything okay? And they'll say, fine. Mm -hmm. So what we've taught coaches to do is to one, look for some symptoms that I mentioned okay. before, but then don't settle for like, are you, you know, yeah, I'm okay. You kind of come back now. Something's up. You're just, you're tired. Yeah. Let's, let's go sit down for a while and it's real and sure. kind of make sure you really explore it with a young person. Sure. Almost like people don't want to think about mental illness as yeah. something they can recognize. There's kind of what we call a fancy word, but a stigma right. with it. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, and of course, the, the million dollar question how do we prevent it? Can we, can we prevent it? Yeah, I, I, I think. Burnout's preventable uh, on a couple fronts. One is it, it, it can be sort of internally driven. So if I'm a perfectionist person, usually it's not being a perfectionist in terms of standards, but it's not being able to deal with mistakes and failures. So I might work with like a sports psychologist on how to deal, live with mistakes and not like them, but as the famous basketball coach John Wooden said, they're the building blocks of success or how to 
after practice, uh, one coach talked about I'd, I'd park my sport stuff at the end of the court and then leave and pick it up the next day. So when I go home, I'm a regular person. So some of it's that way. Uh, a part of it ties to physical training. Right. If somebody's overtraining or uh, uh, depending on the age of the athlete, they're, they're in three teams and they're going and they don't take breaks. Mm -hmm. So physiologists will tell us, exercise sport physiologists, you want a periodized training sure. plan and you want to use good science if you're a swimmer and take breaks. Mm -hmm. You need to work really hard, but you take smart train. Sure. hard and smart take appropriate breaks sure. and finally if it's sort of driven by crazy coaches and parents that's where coaches education comes in and, and I use crazy in, in a uh, in a nice way because yeah. many times the parent who's pushy etc really loves their child course, cool. they just think <clears throat> the the strategies they're using are wrong yeah. uh, from what we've learned. So how to educate that parent, how to work with that parent to understand that. Sure, sure. Um, you've, you've mentioned the term perfectionism a couple of times in, in, in what you've been saying. Um, and maybe people out there will think uh, perfectionism is a bad thing. But is there a good kind of perfectionism? Are there different kinds of perfectionism? Yeah, um, it's really interesting because most people when you hear perfectionist, that's like a criticism. Yet we see a lot of Olympic champions have perfectionistic tendencies, but we also see people who burn out have pet perfectionistic sure. tendencies. And when they look at perfectionism, it, it's really about setting standards and going for it. And a lot of times there's an organization component. All perfectionists have that. Sometimes they'll call good or bad perfectionist or maladaptive and adaptive. The good or adaptive perfectionist has the high standards and usually the organization, but they don't get too concerned with mistakes and they don't get too concerned if they're younger with parental evaluation. The maladaptive or sort of bad perfectionism, you, you set in high standards, uh, you maybe have the organization component, but you have this tremendous fear of mistakes, etc. and uh, other uh, evaluation that would be negative. So you run around all day setting high standards and then beat yourself up about it. I've worked with some uh, young people, one 20s and one younger, that were perfectionists. Mm -hmm. It took a couple of years, mm -hmm. but it's sort of almost a philosophical shift to learn. Right. Uh, th and I explain it this way. Perfectionism is your greatest strength and it's your Achilles heel. Because sure. if you're 18, you're not going to get rid of your perfectionistic tendencies. You just need to recognize it can be a real strength in this and this and this. But if I don't learn how to deal with it and turn it off, if I don't learn how to let go of mistakes... Yeah. So sometimes it's as simple as you got 24 hours after the game to feel bad. You go home, beat yourself up, and then we flush the toilet and have all the you-know-what leave, sure. and we rebuild uh, after 24 hours. That sounds sensible. And, and another area where sports psychologists can, can help. Just returning to the, the, the burnout issue, not sure we can give an answer to this, but I wonder if, if we'll be able, as spectators to, to see burnout in the Olympics that are coming up soon? Um, I, I don't think you'd be able to see burnout in the Olympics. You'll be able to see some poor performances, mm -hmm. maybe as a result of overtraining. Announcers will come up with all sorts sure. of things, but you never know if a, if a marathoner was it their training plan was wrong. Right. Was the, uh, in our country, we just had the Boston Marathon and the heat was higher than ever, so people dropped out all over. If you had a 90 degree Fahrenheit day in London, people are going to be, sure. you know. Sure. So I don't think you can see it. There'll be some speculation. Right, right. And, and again, one of our problems in psychology is, is pretending that we can understand exactly what's going on in somebody's head. And we, we must avoid that, that desire to, uh, to think uh, we know everything. I'll tell you a funny story. Many years ago, I worked with a professional race driver who was having negative thoughts. He was going through a terrible uh, divorce. And there's a technique called thought stopping where you, have, you, you write down your specific negative thoughts, then you have a signal like a stop sign that would stop it, and then you have some replacement thoughts. Because he's going 200 miles an hour left having negative thoughts, and he could kill somebody, including himself. And his, his negative thought or his stop, thought stopping mechanism was an elephant. 
And I never had anybody come up with an elephant because he won this big race we have in America in NASCAR. It's not Formula One, but it's called the Daytona 500. Oh, we know it well. And he, he, they put him on an elephant after he won it. And he said everybody got out of the way and it was black, not gray. And in his car, they have the cameras in the car now. And on the what they call the row bar that comes down, he had an elephant. Mm -hmm. And I had a laugh because the sport announcers were going, in our country, the Republican Party are elephants. And they go, he's a Republican. And all it was is his stop yeah. signal. False. So when he saw it, he had a cue to think stop. Yeah, false attributions. <laughs> Thanks again, Dan, for your insights and your expertise. Thank you. A little bit about burnout and overtraining from a sports psychologist, Dan Gold. Let's move on with the rest of the lecture. Think about for a second, how has sport changed in recent years? When we think of sport today, we think of it as a full-time job. There's practice all the time, there's weightlifting, there's additional practices, there's really not even an off-season anymore. So, the authors of the textbook go on to discuss burnout as, and how athletics has changed recently as looking at the pressure to win and train year-round with vigor. So it's not just going there, showing up, but with vigor and intensity and has increased dramatically in recent years. This has been due to a lot of financial rewards and publicity uh, for uh, well-known athletes and professional athletes and Olympians and the status that they achieve, um, especially with Olympics uh, and Olympic coaches and professional coaches. So both coaches and athletes have felt this pressure to win and train year-round to be better and better and better than they were before. So when we look at the demands of modern sport, we know that there are higher performance demands than before. As the pressure to win increases, athletes and coaches spend more time training and feel more stress, which this sometimes leads to overtraining and burnout. Because of this training more and competing more, and this pressure, we continue to push the limits, and push the limits, and push the limits. And because we want the best athletes possible, we're looking towards younger and younger stars to fill these roles, these, these main roles and these professional roles at such a young age. So right now, uh, our off-season, because we're training some more, is really blended with our in-season and we don't give athletes uh, time off and time off to rest and recover like they should. So typically, when we pair this with burnout, we typically talk about burnout and overtraining in sports, but this can happen in fitness as well. For example, in fitness, this occurs when people try to get bigger and bigger, stronger and stronger, with the idea that more training is better. So you may have known a person that go to the gym uh, before work, maybe goes to the gym during lunch, maybe goes to the gym after work for a couple hours. Uh, going to the gym and working out this much to get bigger and bigger can actually turn into a disorder and can cause somebody to be overtrained and burnt out. So let's talk a little bit about an example about how this sport has changed and a, a, a real life example. So in the world, sometimes, like I said before, we turn to younger and younger people to be stars. So one of the one of an example of uh, a younger star that had burnout, and we'll go through her kind of career, uh, was Jennifer Capriati. Uh, she was a tennis player, and Sports Illustrated uh, quoted that at 14 she was up, at 17 she was down, and now at 25. So look at that, 11 years later, she is incredibly back up again. How the ballsiest woman in tennis got her game and her life back. So let me walk you through just her career uh, from when she was 14 until when she was 25. So uh, in 1990, when she was 14, uh, she made the semifinals of the French Open and Wimbledon. Uh, she ranked eighth in the world, and she was making $6 million in endorsements and sponsorship. At 14, that's crazy. 
1992, she won the Olympic gold, and that's when she was 16 years old. She was the youngest ever Olympic champion. And in the following year, this is when she was 17, so just three years, one year later after winning the gold, and uh, three years later after becoming a star tennis player, she dropped out of the tennis tour. She lost the first round of the U.S. Open to a 27th ranked player. She was she was ranked high in that tour, and she lost to a 27th ranked player. And in December of that year, she was caught for shoplifting. The following year, she had uh, she was caught with marijuana in her possession, and she had to go to drug rehab. And again, she dropped out of the tennis tour again. Two years later, in '96. She tried to rejoin the tennis tour, but struggled to regain her previous success. She was overweight now, and she was out of shape, and she only ranked 50th. In 1999, she finally won her first title in more than six years after coming back. In, the two, uh, in 2000, she finally made it to the semifinals of the Australian Open. And the following year, she claimed the number one world ranking again. Uh, she was the U.S. Olympic Committee Sports Women of the Year, and she was one of only four women to win the Australian Open and French Open in the same year. <clears throat> the year after, the, or the same year and the year after, she won the Australian Open back-to-back -back years. She made a statement after all of this, and she said that maybe 14 is too young to handle everything emotionally, and I needed to escape from the expectation of being able to win every tournament I entered. I was also expected to be at the top, and if I didn't win, to me, that meant I was a loser. If I played terrible, I thought I could handle it, but really I couldn't. I felt no one liked me as a person. I was depressed, sad, lonely, and guilty. I burned out. After the U.S. Open, I spent a week in bed in darkness, just hating everything. When I looked in the mirror, I saw this distorted image. I just wanted to kill myself. I'm not addicted to drugs, but, I, but you could say I was an addict to my own pain. I had the sarcasm about everything. You can see, at such a young age, she was really not able to handle this stardom that sport had given to her. Uh, and she eventually did drop out, but was able to come back. But she knew during that time that she was not able to handle that stress. So remember, we keep pushing and pushing and pushing our training of our younger uh, athletes. And when we look at this, uh, we're looking at a chart and we're looking at the number of injuries among athletes 19 and under. So these are young stars, and we try to look for younger and younger stars to meet that stardom. And we look at this, and we, we typically see that overuse is the most common factor that leads to injuries in adolescent athletes. And these are just the number of injuries that we see in these sports, uh, a lot of them being overuse injuries because our bodies at such a young age, 19 and under, are not fully developed and they cannot handle the stress of year-round participation. These kids are on multiple teams. They're usually doing the same sport. So if they're playing the same sport on an in-season, off-season, travel team, multiple teams all year round, they are doing the same movements and this leads to that overuse type of injury. In addition, these children that are on all these teams typically have a lot of parental pressure and pressure from their families to do well. So now that we have an understanding of where we're at in sport, let's look at some definitions. We'll spend most of the lecture here with definitions, and uh, I kind of split up uh, the lecture into different parts. And you can run, you can see the running part on the bottom here of overtraining, staleness, burnout, and dropout. And we're going to work through this, um, this process for the rest of the lecture. So typically, when we look at someone that's burnt out, uh, they have overtrained. Uh, and overtraining is a short cycle of training uh, during which athletes expose themselves to excessive training loads that are typically at or near max capacity. We're really overloading uh, that athlete to train higher and higher, and we don't give the body enough time to uh, adapt to this overload. 
So what happens is when we have some sort of a negative overtraining syndrome, uh, we are very excessive. We usually physically overload our body. We don't get adequate rest. We result in performance decreases and the inability to train at even normal levels. So this process of overtraining um, happens uh, in a short period of time, like I said, but usually 72 hours to two weeks um, in total. <clears throat> so we can see in the diagram on the right, um, and we'll get back to this in a little bit, but we can see that there are different parts to this type of overtraining and overload. So uh, when we look at it, we, we are overloading the body with a lot of stress. This causes to overtraining. And we typically try to overreach, and that means reaching expectations that we typically can't get at the, at the period of time that we're at in our training. And this could lead to a couple different outcomes. Uh, this could lead to that positive overtraining where we actually improve our performance. The more negative overtraining syndrome that, that we're really focused on today as we lead to burnout but that causes staleness and impaired performance, or we just maintain our performance in, in B and there's no change in our performance. So we know that this is usually thought of something as negative. And what we wanna do is we want to really have periodized training. And this is just a deliberate strategy for our coaches and, and our trainers uh, so that uh, we expose athletes to high volumes and high intensity training but we also are able to taper them to lower training loads uh, in stages so that they can perform uh, at major competitions and possibly championships. So again, let's look a little bit more in depth with overtraining. Uh, we know that there are uh, a lot of things that go into overtraining. It's a very complex concept. So let's start by really looking at uh, training stressors. And this could just be uh, training stressors as in physical training stressors, but it could also mean that there are non-training stressors as well. So when we look at our non-training stressors, this could be anything that's happening in our lives, whether it be school, if we're a student athlete, or maybe we're a professional athlete and we have home issues, but these are are non-training stressors that add into our stress. And once we become overstressed, uh, our, we can't get good training. In addition, if we're overstressed, we don't get the rest that we need after we train so that we're ready to train again after. So we know that uh, there are two parts to this overtraining. We have the physical and then we have the um, outside of the actual training. Uh, but how can we identify? Can we pick up on performance and, and some signs that we, we can figure if an athlete is overtrained? Well, first and foremost, we can look at the performance level of the athlete. We can also look at the mood state of the athlete, maybe what kind of emotions they are expressing, their body language when they come into practice or treatments, and their facial expressions. If they give an expression of being exhausted, maybe they're saying that, oh, my legs feel so heavy or that their body has heavy strains or they're very tense, okay? Then that's a, a signal for us to know that they are, they are overtrained. If we're able to pick up on these signs, especially our moods when they come in and express that they're in a bad mood or that they do feel tired, uh, then we have a better chance of helping them at this point. Uh, if we're able to identify these things, we can help with the recovery uh, typically, we want to use this as a holistic perspective, and we want to lower the training load so that we get some rest. We also want to enhance the recovery process. So maybe that is doing some mental training as we're resting. Maybe that's going in for treatment uh, to a clinic uh, as we rest. But for sure, we want to definitely lower that training load. So a little bit more about our mood states and overtraining. So we know that overtraining affects both our performance and our mental health. And our mood states specifically, um, they increase as training stimulus increases. So uh, the heavier training, the greater the mood disturbance. And this mood disturbance could be increased depression, anger, 
uh, fatigue, maybe decreased vigor. Because we know that when we look at the psychological profile of an athlete, and we looked at this at the beginning of the semester, that elite athletes typically follow an iceberg profile. And at the top of this uh, iceberg profile is this idea of vigor. And we want vigor to be high, anxiety to be low, depression to be low, fatigue to be low, to low and confusion to be low. So we know that we want that increased vigor. But sometimes when we get into overtraining, we have this flip where we have decreased vigor um, and we have increased anxiety and fatigue and depression. And our overtrained athletes, uh, typically we see uh, that they have an inverted U or inverted iceberg profile. So uh, this negative type of mood profile is pronounced and it leads to uh, typically performance decrements. And when we look at performance, we know that as we increase the volume of training, uh, we also get levels of anger, increased levels of anger and anxiety. This could lead to uh, decreased performance levels and eventually staleness and dropout. So let's move on to staleness and try to define that and discuss some prevention and some causes of staleness. So staleness is a significant performance decrement that persists for at least two weeks. So this is going beyond just overtraining. So this is the second step of the process. And it's at least for two weeks, and that without a doubt was caused by too much physical training. So it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, an injury or caused by an illness or injury, but we know that it's too much training and it's over two weeks. Our physiological state of overtraining, uh, this is really what manifests during staleness, uh, and we deteriorate our readiness to perform. And when we look at the end result of staleness, uh, an athlete cannot maintain uh, standard training regimens and cannot achieve previous performance results. So this is on top of already being overtrained. Uh, they can't even meet their performance expectations that they were, to, were able to before. So you can see some, some numbers within that definition. So we know that there's, uh, if we see performance decreases, it's greater than 5%. Uh, for an extended period of time, this was at over two weeks uh, that I talked about before because of too much physical training. Uh, so it includes, staleness includes both physiological and psychological symptoms. Uh, some of the physiological symptoms that we see cause this impaired performance. This could be high, high resting heart rate, uh, high blood pressure, uh, delayed return to normal heart rate after training so it stays elevated. Uh, significant weight loss because they're not taking care of themselves, uh, maybe impeded respiration, and bowel disorders. Some of the psychological symptoms that we see uh, typically uh, come out in mood disturbances and increased perceptual effort during exercise. So maybe we have sleep disturbances, maybe we have lower uh, or loss of self-confidence, maybe we're just tired, maybe we fight more with our teammates, we have a lack of appetite. Uh, and in general, we have fatigue, depression, anxiety, and anger and confusion, which remember, these are the opposite of what we want to see with our positive elite athletes when we look at the mood profile using the profile of mood um, uh, survey. <clears throat> so when we look at staleness, remember, this is the second part to um, our overtraining and our way to burnout. So let's look at some causes. Uh, some of the uh, more typical causes for uh, staleness are length of total season. So how long is your actual season? Is there an off season? Is there a preseason? Is there a postseason? Or is it training year round? So there's a very big difference between somebody that plays football and has a preseason, in season, postseason, and off before they start with a spring season and swimming and diving or possibly track and field where they have extended periods of training and longer seasons uh, just in general. Maybe it's the monotony of training. Maybe there's, uh, there's no fun in training. Maybe it's the same practices over and over again. And really, they're just going through the motions of going to practice, uh, doing what they need to do, and then going home. Maybe the coach hasn't given a lot of reinforcements. 
Um, maybe they feel uh, a learned helplessness. Maybe they get to a point where they keep doing the same thing over and over again and they cannot increase their performance. And if we see somebody that keeps training hard, harder and harder and they cannot increase their performance, maybe they have this feeling of helplessness because they can't improve their performance and that is a major cause of staleness. So when we look at these causes, we know if we see one of these or we're aware of a longer season or that we have the same uh, training regimen over and over again, uh, maybe we can prevent it before we get to staleness or burnout. So when we look at prevention, uh, we want to keep the season's length in, prop in, in a proper perspective, meaning that if there's an off-season, make sure that it's an off-season. We want to formulate practice sessions that eliminate boredom, make sure that there are some fun days, maybe make sure that there's some cross-training involved in practice so they're not doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, we want to make practices and um, actual game time more rewarding. So give rewards for things that they do well. Give positive reinforcement. In addition, during this time of training and possible overtraining and staleness, we want to schedule uh, some timeouts, time away from competition, time away from practice. So maybe it's, it's a time where the team goes on a hike or maybe they have an overnight stay, some sort of team bonding experience. We want to allow the athletes to have some autonomy and make some choices. Um, maybe they plan some practice periods and this helps break up the monotony and the boredom of practice. And we also uh, can set uh, short-term goals uh, and provide rewards and incentives as they complete these goals. And make sure that these goals are fun, uh, especially in the late stage of the season when everybody's to the grind. Uh, and maybe have some fun goals for the practice as well, not just for competition. Some additional things that we can do uh, is that we can use relaxation techniques. Maybe we can use autogenic training. Maybe we can use progressive uh, muscle relaxation in order to relax and take a time out from that season to then recenter ourselves. And we also want to eliminate any physical causes um, and then learn to disregard mental distractions. And we can disregard mental distractions by using self-talk, stopping those negative thoughts and replacing them with positive ones, or maybe some imagery in order to imagine uh, a perfect situation or a, a, a good training session. So these are some other uh, ways that we could reduce staleness. So we already talked about uh, short-term goals and providing incentives and teaching uh, an athlete to relax. Uh, and, and then we need to be able to eliminate our mental distractions and our physical causes. So this is really the training regimen for that athlete. So overall, uh, let's just look at about some frequencies and stats that's, that have been found in the literature. When we look at overtraining, remember this is the first step. 66% of ACC athletes experience overtraining. That is one time, um, one average twice a year. Okay, So this is a, a, a big percentage of athletes in the ACC. 50% said it was a bad experience, which typically it is because they're overtrained, they're working hard. And 18% of Olympians said that they're overtrained uh, in preparation for Olympic performance. When we look at staleness over on the right, 72% of athletes reported some staleness during their sports season. 60-64% of runners experienced some staleness at least once a year. 30% uh, of sub-elite runners reported staleness. And... And let's look at this last one, this last one about freshmen where they're trying to figure out what they're doing in college, going to class and being a, a student athlete. Uh, it was reported that 90% of them became stale in one or more subsequent seasons after they were stale their freshman season of swimming. All right, so let's move on to burnout. Burnout really does not have a universally accepted definition. But we typically refer to it as a state when an individual becomes fed up with whatever they are doing and they typically just throw in the towel. They're just done. So this has some sort of physical, emotional, social withdrawal, 
from typically something that's formally uh, enjoyable. So we look back to what Dr. Dan Gold said. They have to have enjoyed that sport or activity before, and they really just want to get away from it. This withdrawal is uh, typically characterized by uh, emotional and physical exhaustion and some sort of reduced sense of accomplishment uh, and sport devaluation. So they don't value their role in sport or their identity in sport as much. And this typically occurs uh, because of some sort of chronic stress. Remember, this could be inside of sport and physical or it could be non-training uh, stress. And this really changes uh, the motivational orientation of an athlete. So you can see up on up on the slide uh, that the physiological syn syndrome of burnout has three main aspects. And we talked about emotional exhaustion. This is the intense training and competition. They also have some sort of devaluation of, in sport or depersonalization. This is a loss of interest or resentment to that sport. And then a uh, reduced sense of performance accomplishments uh, where they are achieving, no matter how hard they try, they're achieving low or below expectations, uh, personal targets or coach, coach targets. So when we look at somebody that is susceptible to burnout, we know that there are certain characteristics and behaviors that they typically uh, show or have. Uh, one of them is exhaustion. Remember, we just talked about physical and emotional exhaustion as being one of the three main aspects of burnout. We know that they have some sort of low feelings, uh, low self-esteem, low personal accomplishment, failure, fear of failure. Uh, maybe they have low um, depression, okay? And they also have a low job productivity or decreased performance level. Some other characteristics that we typically see is that those that are that are burned out in sport typically are perfectionist uh, that need to have everything in order all the time and need to do better and better and better. Uh, they are other oriented, so in the helping professions, those that are are helping everybody else and don't take self care time, they are susceptible to burnout. And uh, other one one last one is that they lack of assertive interpersonal skills. So they have a lack of ability to talk to somebody or to confront somebody about burnout or, or, or about something that's going on. So they typically are then stressed more and are other-oriented more and not taking care of themselves. So the two main aspects of burnout, uh, we're going to split this into physical and mental burnout and signs and symptoms. When we look at physical burnout, uh, typically people feel uh, an intense sense of fatigue. They're just overwhelmingly tired. They have, uh, they're have they vulnerable to viral infection because the stress levels are so high from overtraining to staleness and now burnout that their body is not able to take care of itself because their immune system is basically breaking down and they're, they're susceptible to uh, diseases and illnesses that they weren't before when they're healthy or taking care of themselves. When we look at mental burnout, uh, we really have a feeling of uh, a lack of control over our commitments. We don't know uh, or we're not able to uh, confront others and say, hey, this is my commitment. I'm not doing this. Instead, uh, we're just told what to do and continue to do more and more and more. We have an incorrect belief that we are accomplishing less. Uh, we just think that whatever that we do, uh, we really are not getting any better or increasing our performance. And we have a growing tendency to really think negatively and ha have negative self-talk uh, throughout this whole uh, burnout process. Some other signs and symptoms you can see there, uh, we have constant tension, anxiety, depression, uh, we have poor uh, nutrition, whether that be over or under eating. Maybe we're self-medicating with drugs or drinking to get away from the monotony or of the sport. Uh, and we're really just overall uh, not having fun, not enjoying our sport. We're really frustrated in what we're doing on a daily basis. So let's take a quick look at some burnout and professionals uh, before we move on to uh, dropouts. 
when we look at burnout and professionals, uh, the textbook talks about three distinct uh, professions. Uh, first and foremost, we'll talk about athletic trainers. Uh, and when we look at athletic trainers, we are a very other-oriented type of profession. And we are responsible typically for several teams or several athletes, and we work uh, in, the cl- uh, in the field, in the clinic, day after day with long hours. And we have a lot of pressure from our coaches uh, to prepare athletes for the game, uh, to get athletes back from injury, which adds a lot of increased stress to our, to our typical daily, daily routines. Uh, research has demonstrated that athletic trainers have great job stress and really because we're at the beck and call of several teams uh, that uh, we can't devote quality time to individuals uh, to treat them. Uh, typically, when we're looking at athletic trainers, uh, those that are type A personality athletic trainers are very prone to burnout. Uh, they, they feel this because they have a high sense of role ambiguity because they, have, they wear so many hats uh, and they don't have control of their situations. At the drop of a hat, uh, the coach can say, hey, we're moving practice or hey, this competition was changed. You then have to make uh, the, the arrangements to... Uh, change your whole schedule around to be at these practices at these games. For officials, uh, officials or referees in sport, they had they face a, a great deal of stress uh, and they see, receive very little compensation for the stress that they they go through in a typical co- competition. Uh, and and really, their their biggest uh, problem is their uh, they fear a failure. Uh, they they fear failure of making the wrong call or making a bad call, uh, and because of this fear, it leads to increased stress uh, and higher levels of burnout. And once these individuals burn out, then uh, they usually drop out of officiating, which leads to high turnover rates and shortages of officials uh, because of this stress. Uh, officials also have role conflicts and role ambiguity that lead to burnout just like athletic trainers. Last but not least, we're going to talk about coaches. Coaches, uh, we're going to spend a little bit more time here, but these are prime candidates for burnout. Uh, Typically, the stressors that make coaches uh, burnout are pressures to win, uh, and that's from higher administration or the university or the, the team. Uh, administrative and uh, parental interference, uh, that they have both job duties and home duties. Uh, Maybe they have disciplinary problems on their team. They need to fulfill multiple roles. Maybe they're just gone a lot of the time and they're sick of traveling over and over again. They have extensive travel commitments and they have intense personal involvement with, with their sport. When these coaches are burned out, they provide less instruction, training, and social support to our athletes. And if we provide these less, less instruction, less training to our athletes, then they also become prone to being burnt out as well. So this, once a coach gets to burnout, it affects them on the field and in their personal uh, life as well. So we can see that there are certain uh, characteristics that I've listed below that may result from personal and situational factors in, that's affected by burnout. Uh, typically, when we see sex difference between males and females, females have a higher level of perceived burnout than males. Maybe they're just expressing it more than males, or, or, or maybe they're actually having uh, more burnout, but they perceive increased levels of stress uh, because they are expected to coach and nurture athletes. Uh, the difference is males are expected to coach. Uh, they, they are not expected to be as nurturing as female coaches. When we look at age and experience, experience we know that younger and less experienced coaches have a higher tendency uh, to perceive burnout than older coaches, maybe coaches that have uh, learned how to cope with the stress Coaching style it also is a factor. Uh, maybe it's coaches that uh, are authoritarian or more goal-oriented, that we have to win, that we have to win, that we have to get to the championships. Those are going to be the ones that are going to lead or go into burnout closer. Uh, when we have entrapped coaches, uh, these are feelings of uh, 
that they can't get out of that sport, uh, that they have higher levels of emotional exhaustion and decreased commitment and interest in coaches, but they just still feel stuck and they don't get out of, of, of sport. And then we know that social support is lacking uh, in those that perceive stress and burnout. So in order to prevent burnout, we need to provide a supportive atmosphere. This is not just for the coaches, but for the athletes as well, that we need to be able to support in our little network of, of our team or our administration and, and really maybe schedule timeouts away from sports, uh, that we're not thinking about sport as, a, a, at all. Maybe we need to use group activities, some, some team cohesion activities to get back into our team atmosphere and increase our motivation. Again, we go back to looking at our goals. We need to reevaluate our goals. Are we being too goal oriented? Uh, we need to evaluate um, and prioritize these goals to see if they're actually fitting in with the demands that were that are placed in front of us. And then we have to have the ability to meet our goals. Uh, and if we don't, we need to be able to reevaluate our goals. Not meaning that we couldn't meet the goal, but reevaluating them. Uh, for the place that we're at right now in this season. If needed, sometimes we need to reduce our commitments. Maybe we start to have to say no to commitments so that we have some outside of sport time or outside of, of job duty times. And we need to learn uh, stress management skills uh, such as relaxation, progressive muscle relaxation, uh, deep breathing techniques, imagery, thought stoppage in order to help reduce the stress. So here's some frequency uh, about burnout. Uh, we saw we see that it's a little bit less. We talked about ACC athletes before, about 60% uh, being stale and overtrained. Well, now we've dropped a little bit, but 47% uh, of ACC athletes reported feeling burned out during their college career. So out of four or five years, uh, they have felt burned out. Uh, high school golfers reported burned out in their four years of high school, and uh, we know that uh, almost 10% of females and about 5% of males show burnout uh, of high, uh, or show symptoms of high level burnout. So last but not least in our definitions is our idea of dropout. And the term dropout has two meanings. Uh, in sports, uh, it, it refers to a premature termination of sport career. So it's ending at one's participation and something that they've done for a long period of time. Uh, and, and this is typically before the athlete could reach individual peak performance levels. Uh, this is some sort of a phenomenon that um, among athletes in childhood and adolescence, uh, because they just get sick of the training, they're overtrained, they don't find enjoyment because they're pushed too hard or that maybe we were pushed to stardom, uh, but they, they terminate their career before reaching their, their peak performance. This is very different than retirement, and retirement is when an athlete says, okay, I'm done with my sport after they have already reached their peak performance. So we talked about elite sport. So in recreation uh, sport dropout means uh, ending one's participation, uh, maybe in a fitness center, maybe they're going to the gym, but in this more health related uh, dropout, it means just leaving an exercise program uh, before completing it. Or maybe we're leaving, maybe we're injured and we're leaving a rehab program before the end of the program, or for whatever reason that we leave it. In this sense, uh, dropout may happen at every age and not just when someone gets higher in their career or maybe young ones that are pushed to being stars. And it is characterized by including uh, some sort of supervised uh, physical activity. Uh, so we know that dropout can occur. Remember, it's not the same as retirement, but burnout differs from dropouts. Okay, so when we're when we're dropping out of sport, it does not always mean that we're burnt out. Uh, remember, burnout is exhaustion in the activity and having some sort of negative negative attitude. So they're not finding enjoyment over something that they did find enjoyment before, and they have this negative attitude and they're just very fatigued. Uh, dropping out 
could be from any any reason. It could be from burning out, but it also could be I have too many commitments, or it could be that I'm just done with the sport. But most athletes don't completely drop out because of burnout. They may exhibit many characteristics of burnout, uh, but but burnout is just one reason why people drop out of sport. So now that we have a little bit more understanding of the uh, definitions related to burnout, let's look at how we explain burnout. And we have a couple models and theories that we're going to look at very briefly. But um, the first one that we're going to look at is cognitive effective stress model. And this, this is just explaining burnout as a function of chronic stress. So we talked about stress going from overtraining to staleness to burnout to dropout. And we know that because of this chronic stress, uh, burnout ha involves physiological, psychological, and behavioral components in very specific stages. It's a four-stage process. And when we look at these stages, stage one is situational demands. And this is when we have high demands placed on athletes, maybe it's excessive pressure to win, and these demands outweigh potential resources. So this is our, this is our typical definition. If we look back in a uh, previous part of the semester, this is a typical definition of stress, when our demands outweigh our potential resources to meet those demands. The second stage is cognitive appraisal. And when we look at cognitive appraisal, this is how we... Uh, as individuals interpret and appraise the situation. Some may view these as more threatening than others, and if we view it as more threatening, we typically don't have uh, the resources to meet these demands. Stage three is physiological responses, and this is when we have uh, typically a harmful or threatening appraisal of the stress or situational demands, uh, and over time, our perception becomes chronic, and stress produces physiological changes such as muscle tension, uh, fatigue, irritability. Uh, and then that leads into the fourth stage where our physiological responses lead to certain types of, of coping and task behaviors such as decreased performance, interpersonal difficulties, or total withdrawal from the sport. So this is how it looks in kind of a model uh, or a picture stage, you can see the stages here at the bottom, stage one through four, and we know that here's our stress, our situation, our cognitive, our physical resources, and our coping behavior. So these are the four uh, stages, and what leads to, so these stressors are going to lead to this parts of the burnout that you see below. And we start with these personality and motivational factors or stressors that lead to this burnout, and burnout can go back and forth between uh, the situation, the kind of appraisal, maybe it's the kind of appraisal of the situation uh, more than the situation itself. So these go back and forth, as you can see with the little arrows on the screen from those, those burnout categories. Our second model is our negative training stress response model. And this model focuses more on responses to physical training, but it still recognizes somewhat of the importance of the psychological factors. So when we look at this idea of physical training, physical training stresses the athlete physically and psychologically, and it can have both positive and negative effects. Uh, positive adaptations, is they're desirable. That's the good outcomes of training. Negative adaptation is when it leads to uh, negative training responses such as overtraining and staleness. And really we have this idea of this model on a continuum where we go from all the way on the left from, over, from staleness and overtraining to burnout on the right. Third, we have this idea of investment model and this model is not in the textbook, so make sure that you're reviewing uh, the slide closely. Uh, the theoretical model of, of within the investment model, we look at sport commitment, and this mo or this uh, the sport commitment proposes that athletes' continued participation in sports is dependent on rewards, costs, and typically what they invest in uh, in that sport. And these investments and rewards. Uh, which contribute to the person's satisfaction of that sport, uh, predict commitment to behaviors. And when we're when we have really high sport enjoyment, uh, we're satisfied. 
and investments predict commitment to playing sport. Uh, when we have low sport enjoyment, uh, that predicts uh, a dropout or burnout of, of, of that sport. Uh, typically in the sports domain, uh, athletes who were involved in the activity uh, because of being trapped, because of, of not being able to get out, uh, it leads to low satisfaction, uh, high investment, and low quality alternative. Uh, and these individuals were more likely to burn out. So you can see the conditions here on the left. If, if they have rewards, that increases their commitment. Uh, it decreases their burnout. It decreases their dropout. However, if the costs are high, if they have higher costs and they, they can meet, they have low commitment, they increase uh, burnout, and they increase the rate of dropout. So you can read the other ones. Uh, they go on a horizontal line from this condition. So as we look at these conditions, what effect does it have on, on dropout and commitment to sport? Next, which is I believe the fourth one, is a unidimensional identity model. And uh, the, the individual that developed this model was Coakley. And for Coakley, stress is involved in burnout, okay? But it's only a symptom of burnout. The real cause of burnout deals with faulty identity development, it, typically in sport, and external control of younger athletes. So this is really focused on young athletes. So our previous, uh, previous couple models focused on stress a lot. Uh, this model is more sociological, where it's stuff going on around that athlete uh, and how that's causing them to burn out. So we know that stress is involved, but the real cause of burnout is uh, related to social organization. And it really affects the athlete's identity and control issues. So because of this identity and, and control issues, uh, we look at, at, at this outcome as or of identity foreclosure. And with identity foreclosure, this is when athletes do not spend enough time with peers outside of sport. They're so narrow-minded with sport all the time that they have no other identity outside of sport. And this causes someone to only focus on sport. And if they're not doing well in sport or progressing in sport, that leads to dropout. In addition, we have this idea of uh, loss of autonomy. This is not being in or having any control. And remember, this is really about young athletes in this uh, model where when we have younger athletes and we're pushing these athletes to be stars, we don't give them a lot of control or decision-making in sport. We tell them to do everything. And when we don't have them uh, provide some sort of a, uh, give them some sort of autonomy to to determine what they want to do at practice or or maybe when they have a day off, uh, this leads to burnout. We also have the commitment and entrapment theory, and this theory of burnout views burnout in a in the context of sport commitment. So it goes back to the investment model. But burnout occurs when athletes become entrapped and they feel like they, they must play even though they lose that motivation to actually participate. And uh, when we look at um, athletes' commitment to sport, they usually participate in sport for three main reasons. They want to participate, which they, they have fun, they have some enjoyment. Maybe those, and then second, they believe they have to participate. If they believe they have to participate, this is where they feel entrapped by the uh, sport. Uh, they do not really want to participate, but they still stay involved. And this really leads to burnout uh, because these people maintain sport involvement even though they don't want to. Uh, sometimes uh, they may not have a, an identity outside of sport. They may not have an attractive alternative to sport. Or they say, oh, I've already invested so much, I might as well keep going. Uh, but these individuals typically lead to burnout. And lastly, we can have a combination of the two, of, of wanting to actually participate and having to participate. Uh, some other ones uh, that, that we'll talk about, stress and recovery model, uh, really it goes back to our initial uh, uh, model of burnout where we are looking at the kind of effective stress model uh, that we don't get enough time to recover sufficiently. 
and we just accumulate stress over and over and over again and burnout is a product of accumulating stress without sufficient recovery. Uh, Self-determination theory. We've already talked about the self-determination theory previously, but remember people have three basic needs, autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Uh, and when these are met, a uh, person's motivation and psychological well-being are maximized. They're great, uh, but if they're not being met, then satisfaction is decreased, and this leads to that burnout. Last but not least, uh, the integrated model of athlete burnout, uh, and this is kind of a catch-all model where it integrates all the previous models that we talked about to create more of a, a, a complete conceptual understanding of burnout. And when we look at these ideas, uh, it's best understood or burnout is best understood by examining its precursors or antecedents, uh, early signs and maladaptive consequences. Uh, so we know that some antecedents and some early signs are a feeling of entrapment, uh, maybe somebody that's a perfectionist, someone that has a high trait anxiety, low autonomy, uh, somebody that's ego oriented, uh, maybe someone that has a lower motivational climate or maybe that somebody that has um, a, a higher goal-oriented mindset. Uh, these are major influencers of burnout, uh, and they have maladaptive consequences. So when we look at this, this is the model. I know it's kind of small, but you can look at it in the book uh, to review. But these ideas down here, so we can see the antecedents uh, and everything from the antecedents of of early success or excessive training lead to signs of burnout, uh, which is our end goal or end here with burnout uh, and the maladaptive consequences after burnout. Stick with me, we're almost done. Uh, let's talk about real brief how to treat burnout. These very, very, very much uh, reflect how we treat staleness and overtraining. So we need to set short-term goals for competition and practice, and we need to re-evaluate these if we're not meeting them. This can enhance success, can enhance self-concept, and uh, maybe make them fun during the end of the season uh, when we're to the grind. Uh, communicate and provide a supportive atmosphere like we talked about before. Have a stable support system. Maybe it's both inside and outside of sport. Be prepared to have someone to talk to. Learn self-regulation skills or psychological skills such as relaxation and imagery, maybe some positive self-talk. Uh, foster autonomy supportive coaching where we don't tell the athletes what to do all the time, but we give them options. Uh, maybe uh, monitor some critical states in athletes. Maybe we see their stress levels or their sources of stress increasing during midterms or finals, and we decrease the load of training to combat that uh, that critical state in the athletes. And above all, keep that positive outlook. Other ways, staying in good physical conditioning, nutrition-wise, uh, training-wise, uh, reevaluate our goals. Uh, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, the next two, uh, Dr. Dan Gold talked about in the, the beginning video, uh, we need to be able to handle post-competition uh, stress in a healthy way. Uh, Maybe we deal with it for 24 hours and we just forget about it. We flush it down, we forget about it, we move on to the next training session. Uh, typically what we want to do is we don't want those, those, uh, those emotions to continue on throughout our, our training for the next competition. And we also have to take relaxation breaks uh, in order to train our body how it feels to be relaxed in order to have good physical well-being. Here's our uh, kind of a table that puts all that together. Here's our physical stressors and our psychological or sociological stressors, and it gives the stressor here and maybe a recovery strategy underneath, so some application there. At the end here, uh, I have some additional uh, topics, a little bit more about post-competition tension. I don't have uh, uh, notes underneath of it, but just read over these slides. Uh, so this is post-competition tension management where many individuals that are leading to burnout have intense psychological variables that continue after the game is over. This may lead to a lot of post-game fights or drinking binges after the game. Uh, and this is how we handle uh, post-competitive uh, tension. Uh, we're, we're using the same techniques as we did before uh, for burnout, uh, but really right after that, that competition, we need to be 
present for our for our athletes. We need to converse with our players, and we want to make sure that we provide a, a good assessment without being uh, too emotional about our performance. Some other things, maybe have a group activity after the game, get their minds off of the off the competition. Maybe they lost. Maybe we go out for for uh, to eat or maybe have some sort of bonding experience after. Uh, if we do win, we don't want the players to gloat over success uh, so that we get so lost in our training that we don't do well the next, the next competition. Uh, but really, moving on is the best way to kind of combat this, uh, this post-competitive uh, tension or, or, or stress. Lastly, uh, male adaptive fatigue syndrome, you might hear this here and there, uh, but we know that there are many stressors that uh, are placed in our body, and uh, part of this syndrome is that uh, the male adaptation uh, to training stress, which is our overtraining, um, and we see this a lot in college athletes each year, uh, about 10%, uh, but this male adaptive fatigue syndrome uh, follows the same progress uh, or process that we discussed before with burnout. Uh, we go through staleness. Uh, we see somebody that then goes into overtraining, uh, and then that finally leads to burnout uh, because we're so fatigued and we're not able to adapt to this these stressors. So we know that those that are at risk really look like others that are leading down the same road as burnout. They're perfectionists. They are high need achievers. They're very dedicated people. Uh, and they lack strong interpersonal skills. These are all, all uh, characteristics of burnout and overtraining that we talked about before. So in order to prevent, uh, we need to monitor signs for male adaptive fatigue and maybe reduce some demands, uh, change our appraisal, and uh, this idea of stress inoculation training, uh, it's there. We don't talk about it a lot, uh, but really if we're able to monitor, reduce demands, and change appraisal, and this comes out of the uh, cognitive effective stress model, if we're able to do that, then we can stop the uh, progress of male adaptive fatigue syndrome. Last but not least, uh, in order uh, for me to check that you've kind of read the chapter, uh, reviewed the lecture and the notes. Uh, there is a quiz posted on Blackboard. Please complete that quiz uh, and then turn it in on Tuesday of next week when we have class again. Uh, there's also a athletic overtraining and burnout worksheet. Uh, so very important for this, do not complete it as an athlete. Instead, complete it, uh, complete the worksheet according to a period of the semester or point in the semester where you are most tired, most stressed, and least motivated, and fill out that kind of quick survey and answer the questions below. And then some more uh, textbook type of questions. Uh, there are three textbook questions uh, that you need to answer, uh, as well as um, provide some three interesting things that you learned from the burnout and sport video that was at the front part of this lecture. Thanks, y'all. Have a great day.